Uh, this is much better. All right. How you folks doing today? What a way to kick off WrestleMania. The legend himself, Gene Okerlund. Here he is, Justin. A little late. We'll get you up here in a second, Justin. Now, Gene, WrestleMania weekend, you were at the very first WrestleMania from WrestleMania 1 now to WrestleMania 33. I mean, the size of it has grown. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, take a look how it's uh, grown, but just the fact that it's standing on its own two feet as the biggest event in wrestling of the year. Did I you think ever, that's very important. Did you ever imagine, Gene, that it would last this long from being there at the chaos of the original at Madison Square Garden? I didn't think I'd live this long. <laughs> <laughs> no, to tell you the truth, uh, that was really the, uh, the icebreaker. And it uh, changed the landscape of wrestling forever. WrestleMania 1 didn't fly. Folks, it was all over. You could uh, put a bullet in it. Now, leading up to the first WrestleMania, what was the kind of the talk between Vince McMahon saying we're going to have this super show? And obviously you knew a lot, of, a lot was riding on the success of it. But as, as one of the employees of WWF at the time, uh, what was kind of the thought about this giant super show? Well, uh, you have a lot of questions in everybody's mind. He didn't really know what was going to happen. I rode over in uh, a limo with Jesse Ventura, and he said, you know something, brother? I don't think this thing, if it doesn't work out, we're going to be here tomorrow. And uh, he was right. J.J. Dillon, God bless J. you. J.J. Dillon, this is the kind, of, the kind of fun thing you see at WrestleCon. In, in, in from Delaware. We'll get you a mic here, J.J. I want to come up and say a special hello to one of my dearest friends for a long, long time. And I have with me, where is she? She's hiding to get up here. It's my granddaughter. Wow. Oh, my. Hello. That's Rebecca. Me, Gene Oakley. He's the greatest of Happy birthday. <laughs> the kind of amazing See stuff that time. happens only here at WrestleCon. JJ yeah. for a cocktail. Where were Hall you of the Famer. J.J. Dillon. Where were you the day that Mean Gene met J.J. Dillon's granddaughter? Only at WrestleCon. Now, Gene, uh, as a kid growing up watching the, the WWF, you were so integral in, in introducing the wrestlers to us. I would watch, and you would bring them in. Coming to Chicago, where I grew up, you would have them come into the Rosemont Horizon. With those interviews, uh, what did you do? Did you think it was your job to kind of get the most out of these wrestlers? Well, it, uh, wrestlers and all... Also and the managers. The peripheral people. Yeah. Uh, at uh, WrestleMania 2 at the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago, I had the dubious distinction of working with Gorilla Monsoon, the late great, and Kathy Lee Crosby, <laughs> the wife of Joe Theismann at the time. She went through quite a few of them after that. <laughs> but uh, on that show it was the WWE superstars against the NFL. Sure. And Chicago, by the way, at that time, had that world championship team, and it was loaded with Chicago Bears. One of the guest referees, you know about Chicago. <laughs> One of the guest referees was Dick Butkus. <laughs> he and I started early on, about 11 o'clock on the beer, <laughs> and by the time showtime came around, the bell rang, we were in the bag. But he called it fair and square. One, two, three, out. Very enjoyable. Now, Gene, with those interviews that you would do, uh, who were some of your favorites that when you saw, okay, I got this guy coming up in the wings to promote the show at the Spectrum, who were some of your absolute favorites that you knew the chemistry was off the charts with? You're talking now about talent, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, obviously, uh, Bobby Heenan was a man who was... Bobby, let's hear it for Bobby Heenan. Legend. A very articulate man, a great manager, a great broadcaster, and by the way, for the record, he could do it in the ring. Amazing bump taker, and down, yeah. amazing. Boy. Would make anybody look like a million bucks in the ring. Absolutely. But I mean, then after that, uh, we got all kinds of people. The Nature Boy, Ric Flair. But of course, how about the crazy interviews with the Iron Sheep? Snooker, a little off the wall, but who can convince the great immortal Hulk Hogan? There you go. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, Gene, I'm curious, on the flip side, you talked about the great people to conduct interviews with that have that energy. Who did you have to work extra hard to get a good local market promo or event promo out of? Well, a very familiar name, you won't believe it. Juventud Guerrero. <laughs> the juicy one. Yeah. A legendary Nitro promo with you two yeah, in the right, ring. Which I didn't, didn't realize he didn't speak English. <laughs> well, Something they might have wanted to run past you before yeah. that. Right. Moving to but Guerrero the also does not realize that out. he doesn't speak English. That's something you two have in common. I had a great punchline for the one, two, three kid, Sean Waltman. And Kevin Nash uses it all the time. He had this absolutely horrible interview. <laughs> Couldn't ad lib his zip code. <laughs> and at the end of it, I said, you know something, kid? You're a breath of fresh air. <laughs> now, the interview over and it worked. One of my absolute favorite things to do is watch those old promos with you. When somebody like the Iron Sheik uh, or Wendy Richter with his classic, I'm not going to lay down, I'm not going to let anybody lay down on top of me, and you kind of start breaking a little bit. You start laughing a little bit. You kind of put your hand up or you'll turn a little bit. <laughs> what was happening, especially with those live interviews, when you're losing, you're, you're about to laugh, and you know, I can't laugh in the camera right now, but Wendy Richter just said something so funny, I'm losing my mind. You wonder where the hell they're coming from. <laughs> uh, Paul Orndorff was another one was a little like that. Uh, we had the Great Turkey Tournament in Hartford, Connecticut at one time, and it was a strange match. The, the loser was the winner. <laughs> but they brought in a turkey. Howard Finkel picked up this turkey in Groton, Connecticut, brought it up, they put it in a cage, and the Iron Sheik choked it to death. So we didn't have a turkey to work with. <laughs> Nonetheless, the show went on. Who can forget this one? Speaking of Hartford, the Survivor Series, and the Gobbledygooker. Wow. Your favorite? <laughs> what was that? I, I can forget it very easily. Yeah. Did you know throughout the buildup what the end result was going to be? Didn't have a clue. Back in those days, he didn't smarten up the announcer. I have a question I've always wanted to ask you. When Ric Flair was doing the famous with a tear in my eye promo after he won the Royal Rumble, you yelled out, put out that cigarette. Who was smoking? But I was a, a, a production assistant or somebody on the floor. But you can't smoke in the studio. Right. Christ, it looks like the place is on fire. So uh, I just asked him very kindly, put out that cigarette. <laughs> I think and, that was a question. And I think one of your other most legendary, you were interviewing Rick Rude, and the SummerSlam sign fell, yes. and you just went, fuck it. Uh, <laughs> did, were there any repercussions for that? No, but it... Uh, at the time, I thought it was a big bomb, but it's still something they talk about today. But I'm not, I'm not the only one that's ever dropped the F-bomb <laughs> on Definitely TV. Not. Since that time, a lot, of, uh, a lot of announcers, personalities, and so forth have inconveniently dropped the big one. And it got a lot of attention. Jesse Ventura buried me. <laughs> <laughs> Vince said, cover for Okerlund. You heard what he just said. Jesse said, leave it to some old ball-headed man like that <laughs> to ruin the business and have a foul mouth. Wow. End of story. Now, I, oh, ironic for Jesse to throw out the, the bald-related comments, just saying. Jesse well, wasn't I mean, exactly we all, known we all for know Jesse, a, a very colorful man. <laughs> but the one thing I've always said, you can't trust the politician. There you go. True. Jesse dabbled in it. Now, Gene, in your opinion, how important is the interviewer? You see on, on, on Raw or SmackDown, a lot of times they, they don't let the interviewer be sort of a personality like you were. Uh, how important do you think is the interviewer to the process of helping get over a wrestler, a manager, an angle? Yeah, it's uh, apples and uh, oranges. You know, different today. Uh, back then, if somebody would say something outrageous, I'd have to react to it just naturally. And today, I don't think there's that uh, spontaneity there. Sure if you will, for lack of a better term, but uh, it's kind of the way the business has evolved and it's morphed into something that is highly produced. Much of the interview time, by the way, is scripted, not only for the announcer, who gets very little yep. air time or face time, but uh, also for the talent. And I think in a way that inhibits them and you don't see the natural flow of our business that we saw 20, 25, 30, 40, 
Did I say 40? Maybe. Do me a favor. Write that down on paper and burn it. <laughs> Now, would there be anybody where backstage they would have this great? Sometimes you hear about some people backstage. They're they're hilarious. They're funny. They're charismatic. Then they get in front of the camera. And they kind of freeze up. Did you ever take it like upon yourself? Like I'm going to do what I can to really get their personality to the people. You know, back then though, I would I'd have to say that uh, most of what you saw on television was the uh, the real deal uh, be behind the scenes. Uh, one guy that I loved, Kurt Hennig. Mr. Yes. Perfect. My God, the late great Hall of Famer, by the way. You knew him as a kid growing up? Right. And one of his, one of his running mates was a guy that's going to be inducted tonight into the WWE Hall of Fame, Ravishing Rick Rude, the innovator of the Rude Awakening, where he would kiss you or them on the cheek. Excuse me. <laughs> Did I, did I say something wrong? <laughs> not at all. Now, I'm not going to identify the cheek, no. Right, just, just the cheek. Now, Gene, of course, you're best known for your role as an interviewer, but you're no stranger to the squared circle itself. W what are your memories of, of tag teaming with Hulk Hogan and being an active participant inside that squared circle? It was like being in hell. <laughs> <laughs> they had me, uh, I couldn't smoke cigars. I couldn't have a cold beer. I couldn't have a bratwurst. They made me run. They made me climb stairs, lift weights. It was terrible. And strangely enough, as I take a look at that in retrospect, Hulk Hogan and myself, I was never supposed to be in the ring. Guess who our two opponents were? George the Animal Steel and Mr. Fuji. <laughs> two men that we have lost in the last year. I've said this before, if you've got friends and you love them, let them know now. You never know what's gonna to happen tomorrow.